Welcome to the University of Dundee's Orthopaedic Clinical Skills video for examination of the hand. Upon entering the room, introduce yourself and confirm the patient's name and date of birth. Explain what the exam involves and confirm the patient's consent. Ask if the patient has any pain in their hands before starting. It's important to wash your hands thoroughly to prevent the spread of infection. Ensure the patient is adequately exposed, bare below the mid-arm. The common starting point for all hand examinations is the universal screen. Inspect the skin quality and look for skin changes or scarring on both the dorsum and the palm of the hand in digits. Note any postural changes in the hand, such as clawing due to ulnar neuropathy. Note any gross muscle atrophy. In full pronation, inspect the dorsal surface and ask the patient to close their fist and open again as a gross check of function. In full supination, inspect the palmar surface and again ask the patient to close their fist and open again. Look for any decreased range of movement or rotational deformity of the digits. Note any triggering of the digits due to a flexor tendon swelling catching on the A1 pulley at the level of the metacarpal head. Palpate this triggering if it is visible or if the patient is symptomatic by placing a fingertip at the level of the metacarpal head in the palm. The examination is now continued along the line most suited to the patient history and universal screening. Focus the rest of the exam on the relevant pathology. Examination of the rheumatoid hand begins with inspection for specific hallmarks of rheumatoid disease. This includes ulnar deviation at the metacarpophalangeal joints. Bouchard's nodes are due to osteophyte formation at the proximal interphalangeal joints. It is worth noting that similar swellings at the distal interphalangeal joints are named Heberden's nodes. Both are more commonly associated with osteoarthritis. Swan neck deformity is characterized by hyperextension of the PIPJ and flexion of the DIPJ. It's caused by laxity of the volar plate and an imbalance of muscle forces on the PIPJ. Boutonnier deformity, which is characterized by PIPJ flexion and DIPJ hyperextension, is caused by a sequence of pathoanatomic changes subsequent to PIPJ capsular laxity in rheumatoid disease. Z-shaped thumb deformity consists of hyperextension of the interphalangeal joint with fixed flexion and subluxation of the metacarpophalangeal joint. Completing inspection by looking for evidence of wrist synovitis, such as swelling and rheumatoid nodules at the elbow. Now assess function of the rheumatoid hand. Ask the patient to demonstrate fine pinch by picking up a coin. Chuck or tripod grip by holding a pen. Power grip by squeezing your fingers and hook grip by resisting decoupling of your hooked hands when you pull away. The second possible line of examination is that for Dupuytren's disease. Describe the Dupuytren's. Is it a single discrete band or multiple bands? Is there tethering of the skin? Which digits and which joints are affected? Inspect for Garrod's pads, thickening of the skin over the dorsum of the interphalangeal joints associated with Dupuytren's. The Houston tabletop test assesses whether patients can flatten their palm against a surface. Inability to do so suggests a fixed flexion deformity at the metacarpophalangeal joint of greater than 30 degrees. Measure the fixed flexion deformity at each affected joint using the finger goniometer. The degree of deformity alongside the functional deficit, patient expectations and other patient factors will direct treatment options. Measure MCPJ deformity with the PIPJ extended. If time allows, take a targeted history. Ask the patient when the onset of deformity was and if there are any other areas of the body that are affected. Lederhose disease is a similar pathology affecting the plantar surface of the feet. And Peroni's disease describes such changes to the penis. Dupuytren's patients with involvement of these other body areas are described as having Dupuytren's diathesis, which is associated with more aggressive deformities. Risk factors for Dupuytren's disease include smoking, alcohol excess, diabetes and manual occupations. 
Patients presenting with neurological symptoms should undergo a neurological examination. The three peripheral nerves supplying the hand are the radial, median and ulnar nerves. The radial nerve supplies sensation to the radial half of the dorsal aspect of the hand and it's tested in the first web space. Motor function is assessed by testing power of extensor digitorum communis which extends the four fingers at the MCPJs or extensor digitorum indices which extends the index finger at the MCPJ. If the ulnar nerve is compromised, you might see guttering of the dorsum of the hand, with relatively prominent metacarpal bones due to wasting of the interossei muscles. If the nerve lesion is close to the wrist, the hand may adopt a clawed position with MCPJ hyperextension and PIP and DIPJ flexion due to an imbalance of strong extrinsic muscles and weak intrinsics. If the lesion is more proximal, the flexor digitorum profundus muscle is denervated and becomes weak. This lessens the apparent clawing of the hand. The less severe deformity with the more proximal lesion is known as the ulnar paradox. The ulnar nerve supplies sensation to the volar and dorsal aspect of the ulnar one and a half digits and can be tested at these sites. Now test ulnar nerve motor function. Assess power of AD ductum digiti minimi. Ask the patient to grasp the paper as tightly as possible between the little and ring finger and resist its removal. Assess the power of the first dorsal interosseous muscle by testing strength of index finger abduction. Finally, perform Froment's test to look for AD ductor pollicis weakness. Ask the patient to firmly grasp the piece of paper between their AD ducted thumb and hand. Now attempt to remove this paper. Froment's sign is present if the thumb interphalangeal joint flexes and the paper is held by the tip rather than the main body of the thumb. This occurs because if AD ductor pollicis supplied by the ulnar nerve is weak, the grip of the thumb is compensated for by using flexor pollicis longus. The median nerve supplies sensation to the palmar aspect of the radial three and a half digits. Test sensation at the tip of the index finger and the base of the thenar eminence. Test motor power by assessing the AB ductor pollicis brevis muscle. With the palm up, ask the patient to point their thumb towards the ceiling and resist you whilst you exert a downward force. The fourth type of hand examination is examination of the injured hand. Crush and cuts are the most common type of hand injury and they're most commonly sustained to a digit. Consider what anatomical structures may be damaged based upon the location of the injury. Examine the arterial supply distal to the injury by assessing colour and capillary refill compared to the contralateral side. If the injury is at the level of the wrist, Examine the peripheral nerves as previously described. With injury to a digit, assess the radial and ulnar digital nerves by assessing sensation on either side of the digit. Injury sustained to the dorsum of the hand or digit may damage an extensor tendon. Look for a mallet deformity where the tip of the finger lies in a flaccid and flexed position. This is due to injury to the extensor tendon inserting into the distal phalanx. Active extension of the DIPJ is not possible. Examine active extension against gravity and resistance at each level. MCPJ, PIPJ with MCPJ immobilised, and DIPJ with PIPJ and MCPJ immobilised. Injury sustained to the volar aspect of the hand or digit may damage flexor tendons. Examine active flexion against gravity and resistance at the MCPJ for palmar injuries. Examine the integrity of the flexor digitorum superficialis tendon which inserts onto the middle phalanx by immobilizing the MCPJ and asking the patient to flex their PIPJ. Examine the integrity of the flexor digitorum profundus tendon which inserts onto the distal phalanx by immobilizing the PIPJ and asking the patient to flex their DIPJ. The hand examination is now complete. Thank the patient and explain the relevant examination findings. Ensure to wash your hands before leaving the examination room.